maybe. There we go. Well, welcome to today's class. We're going to take this a little bit, um, a little bit higher education on a CMA. Um, so I'm going to call this class um, "How to Price the Home Correctly." And so, if you're watching this video for the first time and have not watched the CMA or CMA videos, stop this video, pause it, watch the CMA video first. Uh, this class, we're not going to go into so much of the nuances with the MLS, but we are going to go into a few. And um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, you getting off here, Anthony? You can stay on, brother. I know this feels like it's like, it might be a little much for you, but if you got something else going on, go ahead. Yeah, I got something else going on. It's the guy that I was talking about earlier. So, nice. but I'll see you, I'll see you in a couple hours though. Thank you guys. See you, brother. Um, yeah, so today's class is going to be uh, um, uh, more of that advanced level, more of the things that I've been watching and seeing that we don't have in our, our original CMA video. Uh, because the first video is a lot about just the how-to, right? This the six months, um, you know, around the neighborhood, a mile around, and trying to make sure your your criteria is is very similar. Uh, but but what happens? What happens when you can't find three comparables? What do you do? What if you have that unique property that's a unicorn in the neighborhood, or you know, somewhere in um, uh, somewhere in a golf course community? or like Melissa just said, um, uh, patio homes. Some of those one-off niche properties, like how much is a pole barn worth? How much is a loafing shed worth? And, and so we're gonna kind of hit on some of those things today. And, and what I wanna precurse with is the, so these nuances, it, it, it's, it's, we're gonna get close. And, and I really want you guys to understand that when you guys are pricing a home, the idea is, is that we have to get close. Right, unless you want to go through a certified appraisal course to become a certified appraiser, you're, we're only ever going to be able to get close, just because we're licensed for 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 we're licensed to get somebody from contract to close. Right, we need to understand it. We need to get close on price, but we need to let the market depict. Um, so let, let's first start off by just asking a few questions. Uh, there's no responses. I don't expect a response here, but um, in this. In this market, we're in a, you know, it's uh, February 3rd, 2021, Northern Denver, Colorado. I don't know how long this video is going to be out there for, but we are in one of the lowest inventory levels I've ever seen as far as the, 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 the rapid pace that things are coming on the market and going off the market. But what I also am seeing is if I did a search right now, and I do, I have an example exactly for this, this, this class. If I look up a property right now, that has been on the market for a couple of weeks, but it's still priced, you know, let's call it 500,000 and less. Why is it not selling? It's a big house. And I've got an example. Let's start this class off with this example here. And I wanna, I wanna make this interactive. I want some thought. I want some, I want some interaction because a, a lot of you on here are the ones that are calling me um, about different homes for sale, about where we should price things and some of those nuances. Some of the nuances we're gonna talk about today Michelle has brought up to me, and I appreciate you guys always bringing up your CMAs to me uh, to make sure that you're pricing the home correctly, as well as, yeah, M M Michelle, you've had some nuances and some properties that have some unique features. Um, but there's one that I want to take a look at here because this one is kind of puzzling to me. Um, I'm still kind of puzzled. We're going to look at this in real life, and I can't tell you exactly, but I have a hunch on why it's not selling. Right. Is this one that you just found, Bruce, or this one isn't yours, right? This this one is not mine, no. Uh, but this is one that, and I had another agent reach out to me because their buyer uh, was was like, wait, is it like we know why we don't we haven't gone to see this property, but we don't know why it also hasn't been sold because they've basically this this client has had um a, a rough go uh they've they've gone out like two or three times with their agent and i mean properties that have been on the market for you know 13 14 days they get all the way to the house after they get off work and you know the buyers are driving from longmont the agents driving from longmont and they get all the way up to the house 
And, you know, uh, the, the, the last time, I think this was on Monday, uh, the selling agent called the buyer's agent was like, Hey, we're going to be, you know, um, accepting all offers, you know, by today at five and you guys got a showing set up for four o'clock. So let me know if you have any interest. And it's like, wait a second, this house has been on the market for 13 days. What, what happened here? And then the agent said, yeah, ironically, we got an offer uh, right around two o'clock this afternoon. And they're really pushing us to make a decision um, because they've been, been getting beat out. And I'm like, well, my buyers have been getting beat out too. So what are we going to do about this? Right. And so that agent called me and, and said, how can I, how can I alleviate this? First and foremost, this is just a little tidbit, I guess. If you're with a buyer and you're in this market and you see something like this, 79 days on the market, it doesn't take but 10 seconds to Taylor Bunny. <laughs> that's a name. Um, it doesn't take t it doesn't take but 10 seconds to just text this agent and say, hey, I'm going to be showing this house. Is there any interest in the offers on the table? So that way you and your sellers or you and your buyers have full on, you know, um, uh, knowledge on what you're going to be walking into. So um, in this market, it's it's very kosher to just any showings that you're setting up, ask the selling side where they're at and what they're doing. So that way you guys don't feel heartbreak at the home. Uh, but this one came up. This one uh, looks like a decent home from the, from the, from the rip. It's got 3,100 finished square feet. It's listed for 450 and it's got a quarter acre lot. Um, and for those of you that don't know Greeley, it's, you know, it's in that decent part of Greeley. These are all bigger. Uh, these are all bigger lots in here. Um, and you can tell that just because of the roads, they have a lot of cul-de-sacs and these, it's just, it's a desirable place. Um, but when you look at this, it's 79 days on the market. And so first and foremost, what would be, so we're talking about pricing home correctly today, 79 days on the market, 449, did these people price the home correctly? And, and, and what is correctly? You see, when we say we're, we're, we're nervous about pricing the home, correctly means we need to hit what the market's going to entail. This home may be comped correctly, but the market's telling us that there's something that the that buyers are not caring for. It. So first and foremost, I want to look to see, does it have a high HOA? So something we didn't talk about in the CMA video was how does a, how does a high CMA dictate kind of what, what a home could be sold for. So one of the things you have to be careful with is a, 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 an HOA, did I say CMA? A high HOA or a high metro tax or a high property tax could be the determining factor between where a home is priced. It could be the difference between your home is just overpriced by $10,000 just because of an HOA or a tax and if you reduce that price down from ten from ten thousand dollars, it could sell all day. But if you, it also could sell all day ten thousand dollars higher. You never know in this market. But what we got to do is we need to talk about some of the metrics, some of the things to watch for, because your first week on the market is the most crucial week on the market. You have to price the home right the first week on the market, and the way that you're going to do that is you're going to monitor how many showings you have. In this market, because there's no inventory, you're going to see you're going to see showing spike. There's always going to be a spike the first two days, but after that, you got to monitor how many homes are on the market. And here's your rule of thumb: forget about the first two days on the market. You're going to get a lot of showings third day and on, up to the first or second weekend. There's not really right or wrong. Like let's call it the seven through ten days. You're going to want to see if you're averaging two to three showings a day. And that's an average, right? You don't need two or three showings a day, but maybe on a Saturday or Sunday, you have five or six. And on the weekdays, you might have one or two. But if you average two to three showings a day and you're not getting any offers in the comparable market realm, or I should say the, the, what the market's going to hold, you're probably overpriced between one to 3%. Harry, I'd love for you to chime in on this because this is a class where it's a lot of opinion. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I've i told people that if, you go, if you've go if you got 10 showings and you haven't got an offer in 10 showings, the house is overpriced. There's something wrong with the house that 10 people looked at it and not one of them thought it was worth buying. Yeah, for sure. And so um, I'm with Bruce on that. There's something wrong and, you, and you've, got, you've got to sit down and figure out what that is. Um, 
and especially in today's market. So, you know, this house on the market for 70, I was just looking at what Bruce was sending. I wanted to see the pictures, but 79 days, it's got new carpet and it's, you know, um, 3,100 square feet, there's something wrong. 79 days, that's a lot of days. What do you guys think when you see the house? Well, they when they initially priced it, um, they priced it like 20,000 over what it's currently listed at. So like Bruce was saying, you know, getting when you first have it on the market, making sure you price it correctly because otherwise people just see it sit and think yeah. something's wrong with it. But, you know, maybe their price now is more reasonable. Um, but their and, price and I love and I love this uh, from sellers. Well, they can offer anything they want. The problem is a lot of people don't want to go through that, right? They don't want to have to go through that uh, that uh, that process. They just want to be able to say this house is priced right and I want to offer X. Um, and so they don't ever make an offer. Sorry. No, go um, ahead. Okay. So uh, yeah, if you're getting about two to three showings a day, you're not priced too far off. You're about one to 3%. If you're if you get a if you get that rapid amount of showings within your first couple of days and then it just drops off to an average of you know zero to one showings a day, you're probably more like three to five percent away. And here's the other thing, you guys. We're talking about, you know, after we're being on the market, you're gonna know as far as where your sellers are pushing the comp envelope. But that's what you want to have those conversations with. And 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 I'm telling you all of this because. Hold on one sec, somebody's coming, come in. Um, I'm telling you all of this because this is how I talk to people when I'm pricing the home at the house. Um, when I go into a full-blown conversation, when I have somebody who's really looking to test the waters, I'm just going to give them the facts. Look, the market's going to, I'm, I'm happy to. In this market, I'm happy to take an overpriced listing right now. Now, not too far. And so what I'm going to be looking for is, is my seller looking to price the home about 5% over the comp range because because if they are and we start to get a bunch of some showings and then it dies off i need them to have the expectation that i'm going to be having a price reduction script with them so it, when i'm pricing the home and when i'm going through this i i want to know and i want to go into the cma understanding where i think the home will sell and then what is my one to three range what is my three to five range so that way, when you go into your listing presentation, you kind of understand like when they throw out a number and it falls in that three to five range or above, it, there's a good chance that it's going to be hard to, it, there's a good chance it's going to be hard to, to, uh, to get a full price offer or multiple offers. And if you get no offers, we need to have that, we need to have that conversation, right? Um, so that's one of the nuances. So the first thing I'm gonna look at with this house is, is there any HOA fee? No HOA fee, no metro taxing district. All right. The second thing I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna take a look at before I decide that this house is priced wrong is I wanna look at the history. Has this gone under contract a couple of times and then come back on? All right. So now we're getting somewhere, right? And I believe that this is one of the major reasons why this home just hasn't been picked apart yet. They overpriced it at the beginning. And when you overprice something at the beginning, you can shoot yourself in the foot. When you overprice something in the very, very, very beginning and it doesn't sell, um, you really wanna make sure that your price reduction is spot on. So they did a decent price reduction, right Harry? I mean, this is, gosh, $26,000. That's a decent price reduction. And but so here's the thing. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. But here's the thing. See, we look at it as $26,000. And the reality is, is that that number alone is a decent chunk. But if this house should have never even gone to be yep. close to four seventy-five, dollars $26,000 isn't enough. And so that's what it's probably proving to be is it's not enough. All right. So yeah. And the other thing is, so what happens when you price something at four seventy-five, dollars right? people stop looking at the house because even though you lowered it, they go, yeah, it's still priced too high. Even if it might not be at that point and you've lost so many days, right? So if somebody finally decides in 79 days, they're going to go, Hey, let's go low ball. Cause it's been on the market forever. So 
you lost on both ends, right? You lost that it took so many darn days and you lost the fact that you've lost eyeballs. You've lost those realtors who are going to look at it and they're probably going to come in and lowball you because it's been on the market too long. So what else? What, what are some other things? I, I know we got some videos off, but if anybody wants to chime in here, go for it. Otherwise, I'm going to keep rolling with this. So we see that they did a major price reduction, but what we have to look at is, is to see, well, what should the price reduction have been? Just because it's major doesn't mean it was right. And, and clearly, if they did it on 12-1 of 2020, something's not right, right? Because we know, and we have to understand this, when you guys are pricing a home, there's only two things that cause a home not to sell. The first one is marketing, right? If a home's for sale and it's not in the, in the public or the world doesn't know, then it's not going to sell. But the second part is, is because we're talking about the MLS, we're talking about it's advertised very well. The only time that a home isn't selling on the MLS is because of price. So with this property, um, you know, I looked this up and I've already done this. I'll save everybody the, the trouble. Um, they've got this home priced at about a buck 40 a square foot. There's plenty of comps in this neighborhood that I can find all with similar uh, lot size. It's a big lot. It's a big house for a ranch. That, that neighborhood is trending somewhere between 130 and 135 a square foot finish. And so these guys are now, they're not that far off. But when they first listed it, they were, far, they were pretty far off. And so 130 to 135 a square foot comes out to be anywhere between 425 and 430. Somewhere, somewhere in there, for, and you can call it 422, I think is what it actually came out to be. But um, So they listed this thing at 475 and they were much higher than that five to 6% over, right? They were almost $40,000 over where the comps were coming in at. Of course they didn't sell. And like Harry said, they priced it way over and now they did a price reduction and their price reduction is still over market value. And so I get it, the market's hot, they're trying some things out. Um, and this may be somebody that doesn't need to sell. And it, that's hard for me to understand because the one thing you guys haven't seen yet, the house is vacant. Somebody's got some holding costs and they've been holding on to this for, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and, and two other things, Bruce, if you look back. So they went 13 yeah. days at 475 and then they mm -hmm. finally lowered it. So what did they get out of 13 days? Two, probably two weekends to show it, to see what mm -hmm. kind of results they were gonna get. I mean, why not go the other route and say, hey, let's price this house at 440 or 435 and see if we get multiple offers and see if we get some, some you know, that it's a hot market. We might get over what we were asking and that might be a, more of a benefit than the other way. Yep. Yep. Bingo. So we talked about it, right? It, we, we talked about the home not being worth what it's priced at. So we just talked about comps. And, and again, I want to get into this, you guys, because when we go in and we go into a listing appointment and we have our comparable market analysis, I'm educating you guys. And I, I want to say I, because there's plenty of instructors out there that teach CMA classes. I'm instructing you not to list or not to have a price for the home in your, you can have it in your mind, but do not list that on the CMA because you've never seen the property and you've never seen its conditions. The day that I go in with a price in, in, on that CMA, I go in there and I'm probably wowed. There's pro they probably got updates galore. And now I've got something that says their home is worth less, maybe $30,000 less than what I'm actually probably gonna list it for. So again, I don't want you guys to have a price for the home, have it in your head, not on the paper. Because condition also plays a factor. This isn't what we, this is something we did not touch on enough in the CMA class or the CMA training. Just because we can do a CMA with what the neighborhood is selling at or trending at, we also need to understand that where we price the home, it's very, very important to look at condition. Then it's also important for you guys, if you guys really want to get into this game, understand what it costs to replace carpet understand what it costs to replace windows. Those types of things are gonna make a big difference in where something will sell. So I'm gonna blow this up for you. Michelle, I'm gonna use you just cause I, Michelle Harry. Can you guys see this blown up video? Are you guys? Yep. Okay. So right off the rip, you can start to see carpet stains. Yep. Every room, but they're touting this brand new floor. Um, I haven't been in this home, but you can call that 
tongue and groove planking. It could be ceramic tile. I don't really know. I don't really want to. It's like tongue really and groove. Yeah. yeah. But that one looks newer. So they did that right. Everything looks pretty decent. I mean, I, I don't know if I chose some of these paint colors, but so far, all I'm seeing is carpet. But there's a oh. massive area. That's disgusting. Yeah. So what what so you're a buyer and you're walking into that house. What's the first thing you're thinking? Oh my gosh, I gotta spend ten thousand dollars to put new carpets in, or five thousand dollars to put new carpets in. And the house is already priced at X. And so I'm in trouble, right? Yep. Oh, and paint. And yeah, the paint. <laughs> and you, yeah, and you might do some painting, right? But yeah, I so think so. <laughs> on the on a, as a buyer's agent and a selling agent, you really want to kind of have a rough idea of what carpet costs. So I'm talking a decent mid grade carpet can it be anywhere from a buck fifty to four dollars a square foot, and four dollars a square foot that's a high end. That's probably premium. Let's let me go let me go back a little bit. A buck fifty maybe to three dollars a square foot give or take and then another you know call it um 50 cents or so a, a square foot for pad um all the way up to a buck so let's call it four dollars a square foot for carpet and pad you do it at home depot they have free installation um just take a rough measurement you guys have tape measures in your car from your showing kits um take a rough measurement and figure out you know right then and there at the listing presentation because again, if you go into this listing presentation with a range of comps, and I, I recommend anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dollar range, and you're, let's just say you place that home right in the middle before you walk in that door, and for carpet, you're going to start to take off that money, right? A buyer's not going to want to buy that house with that carpet, so a buyer's going to look at the purchase price because we're all so psychological creatures. They're going to look at the purchase price and go, well. I'd pay for this if the carpet was done. So since I got to do the carpet, the house must be worth an, uh, less than, like Harry said, five to ten thousand dollars less. The reality is, is four dollars a square foot. You can have a lot of carpet in there for a couple grand. And and that's what people don't are are afraid, or we don't know enough around to have that conversation when we're listing that home. Um, so I'm gonna keep going here. Here's the other things you're gonna to start to notice. Not necessarily this bathroom, but this bathroom here, right? It's very, very, very base grade. So whenever you have a home where you have this kind of shower that you see here, this shower panel surrounding everything, I'm telling you it's, 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 it's imperative that if you're not gonna replace that shower surround, you need to get a curtain on this thing to take mm -hmm. away a buyer's eye from it. They're gonna look at it they're going to see it. They're going to see that it's not very nice, but you put a photo online with a shower. That's not very nice. So one of the things, like I said, what doesn't sell a house price and marketing, this bathroom needs a shower curtain probably could use a little couple of things on the wall. Why in the world would you ever go through this entire house and paint all those rooms, such different colors. And then this bathroom is stark white to where the photo can bring out the like creaminess of the old shower surround, right? So when you guys are going into homes and, I, and again, we're doing this class, I know this house is listed, but pretend that you're walking into this home, the seller's standing there and they want to price their home. If you don't know how to kind of look at this home and say, wow, from a buyer's eyes, and remember in my, in my seller presentation, I walk around the home, do a nickel tour, because I want to see it from the buyer's eyes. This is where I'm seeing those first glimpses of, oh, great. They did a lot of the, the new flooring in the kitchen and in the bathrooms, but they didn't do anything with the shower. That's going to detract from a buyer's eyes. Like that's what I'm writing down on my notepad, right? And then I'm going to write down on my notepad, paint in all rooms except for bathroom. Can we put up a painting? Can we paint that bathroom? Can we make it go with some more of, of what we're seeing? Because this, this photo is, is rough. In my world, this photo is going to deter a lot, of, a lot of buyers. And so you want to price your home correctly, but you also need to make sure your photos are marketing the home correctly. Because this very photo can cause some of the buyers who might love this home not to go see this home. You could spend $50 and make that room. Even if you didn't want to spend the paint, you could spend $50 and make that room much more attractive 
and I would probably tell my sellers, let's do this, this, put something on the uh, cap, uh, because that brown shows up too much, I'd put some greenery or something there that was for the bathroom. I don't know what the hell it is, but yeah. And then their mirror, look at their mirror. That is yep. the old time. It's even hooked with the brackets with nothing. Around. I mean, you got to make it, it so they don't want to see that. You see, you can see the, you can see the yellowness inside of the caulk trim right here from, from where the caulk was, where the, where the trim was placed and the caulk was done and they didn't even end up painting over top of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, exactly. All of those things you would be surprised. Buyers will be able to see. I'm not just seeing that because I'm an agent. I'm looking at that because, well, I've redone quite a few different homes. What do you notice about this photo here? Well, one of the lights is updated and the other is like old <laughs> fluorescent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What else? You're, you're on the right track with lights, so I'd give you a hint to look at the ceiling. It's got water damage. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's got water damage in it. And Paint, why in like the hell you wouldn't have fixed that if you got the new roof? You know, they have stuff that you can put on it. Yeah, I mean, my Whoa, gosh. Whoa, look at that just, wall. Yeah, the wall's, the wall's wild, right? We got, the paint definitely <laughs> is something in this house. <laughs> what do you notice here? Well, they had the TV and they painted around it. Yeah, that's what I can't figure out. See, from a buyer, they're going to look at, they're going to see that water stain and then they're going to see this and they're going to go, wow, is that the outline? Wait, Harry, I, I agree, man. That might have been a TV mount, right? But wait, why is it so far off center? What's wrong with that wall? Is that a big drywall <laughs> patch? What is that? And all of a sudden, you just get through this home and you're just beating it up. I barely looked through this. I mean, I was going like this and I started seeing all of those things and then I had to slow down because this exterior, I mean, look at this. That's a home I want to buy. Yeah. That's a home I want to buy. That's a home I want to buy. That's definitely a lot I want to buy. And then I start to get inside and that's when it's, it, you're like, wow. So, but we're talking about pricing the home, but I really wanted this video to be a combination of things. Pricing the home in comparison to the condition is imperative. And in the CMA video, we only went through pricing the home in comparison to the comparable market, uh, in, in, to the comparable market uh, uh, statistics. You have to price your home and you have to make sure that that home stacks up. So now you go and look at this. We got this old trash compactor. We got a brand new dishwasher. I think dishwasher. I don't even know. It's so far away from the white. And then you have the two different colors. And what's what's with the back? Uh, what is that? Is that mold? The backsplash? Yeah, it's old travertine tile. Um, and it's down here at the base of this cabinet too. The countertops are older. So if you guys know anything about some of this, what you're looking at is uh, drywall repair. You know, if there's a new roof, I'm sure the water isn't leaking anymore, but that's something that if you can't talk to a buyer about it, they're just gonna scroll through the pictures and go, nope, this house is out. If, they, if, they're, if a buyer's agent can't talk around that, hey, the roof has been replaced. I'm sure that's been taken care of. A drywall patch on that might cost a couple hundred bucks. That might be something the seller's willing to do. Right. You got to You got to If this is the home for somebody, if this is the layout, I'm only seeing cosmetic issues in this home. But there's enough that are going to deter buyers from doing this. How much are new countertops? What does that cost? In this house, I'm going to say that you can probably get a nice Formica for maybe 15 to a couple grand and then uh, some granite, maybe for a couple grand, uh, three to four thousand, maybe. Um New carpet, another couple of another couple grand, some miscellaneous stuff. Let's talk about paint, another couple grand. Um, old yeah, old cabinets. You know what? At least they painted those and put some knobs on. <laughs> like, how do you paint that but not paint that backsplash? Anyways, um, you're adding up all these things, and I'm I'm adding this thing up to be about this house could use another ten grand. Please. So, yeah, exactly. So if it could use another 10 grand and I know that the comps are coming in somewhere between, let's call it, what I say, uh, 425 to 435 or 430 ish area. Um, and you need another 10 grand in this home. Now, does this home compare to the other homes in the neighborhood that are selling for the 430? 
Because if other homes in the neighborhood have very similar condition or about 10,000, see, here's the, let me, let me slow down a little bit. We just calculated a rough $10,000 that may or may not need to go into this home in, 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 in accordance to a buyer's visuals. But another home in the neighborhood might not need paint, might have granite countertops and might have nice backsplashes and new carpet, but it might need a new roof. Well, there's $10,000 right there. But if that one sold for four thirty, then this one needs to have about $10,000 worth of work. Then this one should start to sell for four thirty as well. So the more I look at this house, the more I'm thinking that this house would probably pull an offer around that four thirty range. And I'm not going to go through all the comps with you guys from the neighborhood. I already did all of that. Um, I can tell you that, yeah, about 430, you're getting a very similar caliber home. Something, another home, other homes in the neighborhood are needing some sort of updates or some sort of major component as well and are selling about 430. Um, and so that's how I, that's how I want you guys to walk into these homes. It's, it's when we price our home correctly, it's, it's priced in accordance with the comparables in the neighborhood, but it also has to be priced in accordance with the condition. What's the other thing in here? So uh, Harvey, I'm just going to pick on you and, and a little precursor here, Harvey. I got your email and I was actually going to give you a call this afternoon. Are you available? Uh, no, uh, okay. tomorrow. Tomorrow. We'll call talk. Me, call me anytime tomorrow. Uh, okay. I'm, not putting, I'm not putting you off. I just, my Mondays, Tuesdays are awful. Um, okay. So Michelle, you, you've been doing this a little while now. This has some, this has some cosmetic issues. But what more importantly about these cosmetic issues are, do you think would be more important? What sells a house? Um, well, I would say, first of all, structure seems good to the little that I saw. Yep. And I would just say that the overall feel of the house, maybe, or the location. Maybe, maybe. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to venture to say that these people, I mean, you can tell they, they put in new floors. They put like, look at these can lights, the, the fresh, I mean, I know that they like their paint and I'm not going to beat up on anybody's paint taste because I have no taste in color, uh, but they put in money and they didn't put in money where homes traditionally need it, kitchens and baths. So we know that this kitchen and bath issue could cost about $10,000, but to a, a, a buyer, those are the things that they use every single day is the kitchens and baths, right? So if this person would have not taken so much money and put in all these can lights and all this fresh paint and maybe put in more money into the kitchen and that bathroom, this property may sell at 450. I think that they may have put money in the wrong place. So we got to know all of these things. All of these nuances go into what's important about pricing the home. So if I say that the comps are worth 430 and that the kitchens and bath needs some work, I'm going to have that conversation with my seller that says, look, if you want to list your home at, at, four, four, at 430, I think that's going to be great. We do need to talk about the what if. What if the kitchen and bath remodels are just too much for people? Is that something you're willing to take it off the market for and update those things if that's the feedback we're getting? and then place it back on the market for a higher price. Or if we're not getting any showings and you're not willing to put in any money into the kitchens and baths, are you willing to do a price reduction if this doesn't sell in a couple of weeks? So we're talking about pricing the home, but some of the pricing the home is the comps, the condition, and then also setting the expectation with the sellers. Because if we're not having this conversation with them, this could be us. We might be on the market for 79 days now trying to find a way to, I guess, backwards set the expectation. We're trying to now set an expectation of why it's not selling, but it's not even an expectation at this point. It's a justification. No sellers want us to justify why something's not selling. They don't want us to do that because they want top dollar for their home. And when you start to justify why a home is not selling, you're, 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 you're starting to go against the seller versus if you go in with a comp, understand what, uh, what condition can do to a price, 
and set the expectation with the seller that, you know, I, I, this is what I'd be telling the seller. I'd be happy to take your listing. I'd be happy to list it at 450. Here's the things though, that I need us to think about. Here's what I think. If we get an offer, great. If we get multiple offers, fantastic. If we get no offers, because again, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we need to talk about all three avenues. We, we, we get an offer at list price and no other offers. We get multiple offers and it goes over list price. Or we get no offers. We need to make sure we're prepared for all three scenarios. See, if you set this expectation up first, when it comes down time 79 days on the market to have a conversation with them, you've already set this expectation. You're not bringing up a, a reason condition that the sellers might feel like you're butting heads with them. So I'm going to say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, if we don't get an offer within the first couple of weeks, I can almost guess that it's because of the condition of carpet, some paint nuances, and the kitchen and bath updates. So if we do get that, are you guys opposed to having this conversation again after a few weeks? But hey, I would love to go in our two, to our two scenarios. You see, I'm, I'm a man who's going to sell your home and I want to get you top dollar for it. But I do want to go over some of these major what ifs. So what if the home doesn't sell? And what if it is because of those things? We have two options, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. We can take, the, we can take it down off the market. We can, do, we can update those couple of things. And then maybe cost for cost, you know, let me know what your receipts are and then list it at a higher price. So if it costs $10,000 to put in new carpet, maybe do a, some paint touch up, maybe do some drywall repair and some new countertops and, and some different things in the kitchens and baths. Um, if it costs 15, then we raise the price by 15. But again, what I also want you to understand is that the comparable market value that I'm showing for this neighborhood is around 430. So if you put in $15,000 to this property, I can't tell you it's gonna get you 465 if we're listed at 450. But I can tell you that if, if we are listed at 430 and you put in 15,000 and we listed it at 450 again, I can tell you that your chances are much higher. So that's option number one. We could take it down, renovate, and then put it back on the market at a higher price. Or in two weeks, if we're not getting any offers, we can really start to maybe advertise some concessions online. We can do a price reduction. We need sellers to understand that you recognize that, or I'm sorry, we need buyers to understand that you recognize that and that we might be able to work on this price. So part of pricing the house right is also setting the expectation because if you don't price it right and you have to have this uncomfortable conversation with the seller, you don't want the seller to feel like you're going against them. Questions so far? Just put them in the chat if you guys ever do. All right. So that we just talked about condition. We really hit home on condition here for a little while. Let's switch. Can we back up for a second, Bruce? Just yeah, I, was gonna, I wanted Anything. to add one thing. So let's say they say to Bruce, Bruce, we don't have a dollar to our name. That's why we're selling this house. We just don't have any money. Right. Mm -hmm. Then, then the conversation goes around. Well, look, what if we spent $500? What if we spent $600? And let's do this. Let's clean. Let's get a professional company to come out and clean it. We could probably get one for 150, 200 bucks if we do the right rooms because not a lot of rooms. Right. And then let's just add some co different color to like the bathroom and let's do a little bit to the kitchen, add some greenery or something, something to distract from some of the things that they're going to see. Right. And then, you know, try to clean the, the, uh, the, uh, cab the back backsplash. Just small things that might only equal five or six hundred bucks that will, you know, will help sell the house um, at the condition that it's in. Yep. Yeah. Bingo. That's a great point. Um, I want to I want to go on another point with this because um, this comes up. And, and I think that when we when our market starts to shift a little bit into a uh, more of an even keeled market or it's still a seller's market, but um one of the things that comes up is a buyer, let's say a buyer, you know, wants a new roof put on a seller doesn't have the money to put a new roof on, but the appraisal comes back and says the roof needs replaced before the buyer can, before the buyer can do it. So seller wants to just doesn't have the money. Buyer needs it to be done to complete the loan. Seller probably is feeling like, well, if I let this other buyer go, it's probably going to come up on an appraisal again. And so sometimes when you need to do a renovation, what you might have to do as an agent is call 
maybe five or six different roof companies and ask them if they'd be willing to get paid at closing. So they put the roof on and then they get paid at closing from the seller's proceeds because the seller just doesn't have the money out of pocket, but they might have it in seller or in their proceeds. Um, I would say that fewer contractors than most will do this, but it's still very possible. I, um, um, so just if, if one of your roofers doesn't do that or what doesn't want to get paid at closing, because the risk for them is, is, well, I put the roof on and what if it doesn't close? Seller, you just told me you don't have money. So why would I put my hard work into something that I, that I have a, a risk in getting paid for? Well, the bigger roofing companies will do it because they know they can just put a lien on the property. And then when the lien, when the home sells, they'll get their money. But the reality is, is it's a risk for the contractors. So some contractors will do some of these repairs and then they'll wait to get paid at closing. And so that could be another option or alternative. All right. Any, if there's anything else that comes up in your guys' mind on condition and why condition and the price of the home is so important, let me know. But we're gonna we're gonna switch gears to some of the other um, some of the other nuances, um, and let's just let's just have a conversation around this. So, Caleb, Ariana, you guys scared me. I thought Michelle Harvey was the only one on video because you know it was just on that little tracker over there. Um, well, welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, Guess threw me off there for a second. Where's I at? Uh, let's have a little conversation about um, some other things that go into pricing the home. Um, one of the things that has come up, uh, Brady, uh, Mayor Angeli had this one. He had um, he had a property that he wanted me to help him price the home, and what it was was it was a very large home, very large home. And after looking at it and going through the comps with him, I found out that um, it was a small little bungalow home in the front of the lot. And then somebody had built another structure um, on the property, probably back in the day, and then turned it into, I don't really know, I, I haven't really gone through this with Brady yet, but I don't know if it was another house, if there was like, you know, two houses and they were being rented out. I don't know if it was, you know, the main home and then a shop with like a, like a, like an apartment studio up top. Um, but anyways, now they have basically from the back of the house to the other home, they have, a, they finished like a, like, I don't want to call it a hallway. They finished like a, like a sunroom, but it's, it's more than a sunroom. It's like, it's a finished area. And this is one big house now. So it's got this small little bungalow. And then there's this like living room, I guess like sunroom thing that goes all the way to the back home. And then there's this two-story home, um, and it, it's quite a unique it's quite a unique property. I would love to see it in person, but I absolutely know why this would be extremely difficult to comp out on uh, for, for anybody. It was hard for me to comp out. And one of the things that we we had to look at, and one of the things that I, I realized I didn't focus on in the uh, CMA video, was in this situation, there's a house that has double the square foot of any other homes in the area. And so you, it, the comps are gonna be hard. And, and here's one of the things that I want you guys to wrap your mind around. This is still one of those kind of principles that, that, that is hard to follow. So ask questions, but if I were to ask you, what has a higher price per square foot? A five thousand square foot home or a thousand square foot home? What would you What would you think? Thousand. Thousand. Why? Um, if it's just the guess, that's perfectly acceptable too. Uh, because it because it's in line with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, so, you know, if you have a if you have a huge house in a neighborhood full of tiny houses, you're not going to get. I feel like you're not going to get as much per square foot as you would in, in a house that, you know, is in line with the rest of the neighborhood. I could be totally off base there. No. And, and I apologize. I didn't open up the question with forget about the big house in, in a, in a neighborhood. Let's just say you have a thousand square foot home in a thousand square foot neighborhood and you have a 5,000 square foot home in a 5,000 square foot neighborhood. You're right. The thousand square foot home is going to draw 
uh, more of a dollar per square foot. And the larger home, traditionally speaking, does not draw as much of a, 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 an amount per square foot. And, and here's the reasons. The 5,000 square foot and the 1,000 square foot home, they both have kitchens. That's one of the major, that's one of the, the biggest money pits, not pits, but that's one of the biggest um, uh, financial pieces to a home, right? The other thing is, is both those homes have HVAC systems. The HVAC system that can, can support a 5,000 square foot home, yes, is going to cost a little bit more money than the, than the HVAC system that can support a 1,000 square foot home um, does, but it still needs an HVAC system, which is a higher dollar amount. Then you have roof and siding and all of that. But again, the cost is a little bit down, but you still have on a 1,000 square foot home, you still have about an $8,000 roof. And on a 5,000 square foot home, depending upon if it's a two story or this big sprawling ranch, that's a different story too. But um, you might be only talking about, you know, a $15,000 roof, but the price, but the, the square foot is, is quadruple the amount, but the cost of the roof is only double the amount. So all of those components and factors go into the reason why a smaller home always has a higher price per square foot. What's the other reason? So there's two major reasons. What's the other reason? In the world, there's a lot less people that can be financially approved for a 500 square foot home. And so on a smaller square foot home, you're traditionally going to be in a smaller or what we're going to call blue collar price for a home which means the market is larger meaning there's there's a multitude there's more buyers in that market than in that higher or more square foot type of home and so that's what another thing that we need to talk about we really got to hone in and, and understand that when you price a home we got to look at comps we got to look at condition but we also need to look at what echelon we're in um, I don't know if echelon is the right word, but we, all, we need to know what, what, what things are going for. So in the state of Colorado, what's the average household income? Depends on what census bureau you look at, but it's anywhere between 60 to $90,000. So an average home, yeah, exactly, Harry, exactly. Um, some, so I've watched some statistics say that the average, you know, the average income uh, for a home in Denver is, 70,000, you name it, it's, it's not really over a hundred thousand dollars, right? And so what does that get you? So if the average in an area and usually an average income is a, is a, the largest majority population. So on average, what can an average, let's call it $80,000 family afford? Well, right now with interest rates, we're seeing that an average family can afford maybe 500 or lower. 450 or lower, sometimes 400 and lower. Those all kind of are come into play depending upon their down payment and um, their credit score. But let's just pretend that with the average home, uh, average median income for the Denver area is $80,000. And that those buyers, traditionally speaking, are anywhere between 400 and 500 and below that means they're all in the same buyer pool. So if you price, if, if, if you price a home at 525, can an average home income purchase that home? Only very few of those people can. The people that actually make more than the average are the only people that are gonna be out there looking at that $525,000 home, right? And so what I'm getting at you guys is you have to know, you have to know and understand what echelon you're in. If I'm 500 and under in this market right now, I can expect a decent amount of showings and possibly multiple offers. But if somebody asks me, hey, Bruce, I wanna price my home. I think my neighborhood trends at 850, 900. I'm seeing, all, I'm seeing a lot of my friends and a lot of you know, things in, in the news say multiple offers. I'm hoping that we can get multiple offers for this. What am I gonna tell that seller? Hey, look, there's, you may get multiple offers. Nothing's off the table. But the reality is, is that multiple offers are happening in the medium average income area, which is 500 and under. So 
there's a possibility that we could get there because your home is great and you know you say whatever you want to say but we need to set those expectations and we need to set expectations around what the market can afford and so that's another reason why price per square foot is typically higher on smaller homes it's because smaller homes sell for less than you know sell for the average or less than but more buyers are in that market which cause the demand to go up for those homes, which cause them to be willing to pay more for that house. Okay. So I'm getting myself confused here. So that's really, really, really important. Here's another thing. Let's talk about, we're talking about averages. We're talking about price. We're talking about those types of things. If I have, if I know these, these markets and, and I use Longmont a lot, and I apologize for that for some of you guys that live in Fort Collins, Boulder, Windsor, Louisville, Lafayette, I lose, I use Longmont a lot. In Longmont right now, if I go to, let's, just, let's do this in real time. This is so powerful for you guys to show your sellers too. If I go into Longmont right now, oops, and I do a search for 500 and under, and I'm just going to do de de residential detached. I would do backups and pendings. 500 under. What did I do here? There's... <laughs> I don't know how there would ever be a hundred homes now. Oh, duplicate listings. Hmm. Maybe I'm about to be blown away today. Okay, we'll take away the pendings. I, I forgot that there's probably some new builds in there. So in all of Longmont, 500 and under, there are 26 homes available. Um, right off the rip, I can tell that some of the affordable housing homes uh, have hit the market. So if we're talking about an average income home family, these homes are hard to sell, um, uh, affordable houses. So I'll get rid of those. And then there we go. We got, a, we got, a, we got another home here. Um, and we go... So we have 24 homes in all of Longmont for 500 and under. So that's 500 and under. Now keep that number in mind. How many homes do you think are between 500 and a million? My guess is double. My guess is around 50. Mm, no, 13. So I'm wrong, but here's what I'm getting at. Um, Traditionally speaking, the homes that are above the, where an average income family can purchase are going to sit on the market a little longer because their buyer pool is much less available. Usually when I do this search, anywhere between 500 and a million is usually about double what the market will entail. I don't know why it's about half on this. I apologize. The interesting thing, Bruce, is maybe that they're on the home, they're on the, they're uh, on the market longer. In other they words, they definitely usually are. Yeah. Um, and, and they, yeah, homes that are priced above where the average income for a family is traditionally stay on the market a little longer. They're the homes that, um, you know, a couple of weekends, maybe have one offer, maybe they get the first offer their first weekend, but they don't have 17 offers on the table. So supply and demand comes into a very large factor for where you can where you can list a home. If I have a home that is, you know, if I do have a home that I think is worth about nine hundred thousand, but the sellers say, "Look, we want to fire sale this thing. Let's list it at eight hundred thousand and see what happens," because we just don't care. We need to get to Florida for X, Y, Z. Money is no problem. You're going to get multiple offers. You're probably going to get 17 offers because the market also in that price point from 500 to a million, they also are, are watching the market. They know when they see a good deal, you know, and so do your buyers that are looking in the 400 thousands. So if you have a buyer looking in the 400 thousands and a property comes up for 300,000 and it's completely done, 
has the same square footage as a $450,000 property, there's going to be a multiple, there's going to be a, there's going to be a madhouse at that property, right? So our buyers are not idiots. And that's what we need to make sure our sellers understand that when we price this home, one, we need to look at condition, we need to look at comparables, but two, we need to look at where we're at. What does this market hold and what does this entail? Um, there's, there's something I want to show you guys here. And for those of you guys that don't know, we do use a new showing system now. And that showing system is called showing time. Bear with me here. I seen it the other day when I was preparing for this class. But in showing time, it's going to start to show you the metrics. There, there's a place where it can show you the metrics behind how showings are happening and what's happening in different um, um what's happening in different price points. So this is a good tool to use to show a seller what kind of I think it's this one. Nope. Here we go. Um you can play around with this thing here. We'll just do one right off the rip here. Let's do one more of these. So they have these charts. These charts are super, super, super powerful for a for a uh, for a seller to see this. Take a look at this. This, this now, okay. So I really, I, I really feel bad that I just tried to use an example on here that showed the 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 inventory levels of double five hundred thousand and under versus five hundred to a million, and there was only that. I assure you guys that if you guys were to watch this video and do this in a different market. Like I said, our market is crazy right now. There is nothing out there, which is why I think we're not seeing this. This is the graph that's going to show you what I'm trying to relay. So I apologize if you guys saw that and thought, what the hell is Bruce even talking about? This is what I'm talking about. In the last, let's see the last 90 days. So in the last 90 days, here's the number of showings that have happened at the different price levels and ranges. Look at how many more showings are happening. Five, like, look, how, look how many more. Look, oh, crap. We're not even into a million. Sorry. There we go. Look at how many more showings are happening in that 500 and under range. So here's the 500 bar. And then the largest bar is the 450 to 500 range. Look at all these showings that are happening here. Now, as soon as, and like I said, again, I look at the economics of Colorado a lot. As soon as we get over where the average home, uh, the average household income is that can afford a property. And like I said, I've done the math. If you make about $80,000 a year, Unless you have a pile of cash, it's hard to get pre-approved for over 500,000. But there are people that have a lot of cash right now. So even people that are average income earners, there's still a good number of them that can purchase between that, you know, call it five, you know, five to six hundred thousand dollar range. So that's why you do see a, a, a healthy number of showing still in this range. But look how fast it drops. It drops in half as soon as you get over the six hundred thousand dollar range, and so you, there's your, this is powerful information for your sellers to understand and to see where things are being shown and where things need to be priced, right? I, according to this graph, I'd be very leery about listing a house right now in Longmont between eight hundred and eight fifty. I would I'd either try and figure out if that home um, really is worth 800 to 850, maybe price it there. But if there's some hesitation, you might, you might want to try to be 799. 
because that's where some people's uh, showings are, are happening. Everybody tracking right now? Everybody see where I got to this 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 thing? And and play around with this. I mean, you guys saw there's multitude of different report. Sorry. There's multitude of different reports in here. Some of them are for you, but listing activity is the one that I tar that I targeted here. And that's just in showing time, right, Bruce? This is just in showing time. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It was target market analysis. Sorry. And then I went last 90 days. There's 100,000 to a million. Um, I, I personally like to go no minimum. So that way you can show everybody what you're looking at. And then you've got that graph that comes up. But these are powerful tools for your seller and this can help you price the home correctly. Um, let me see if I can change this from a bar graph. Uh, there's a way to use a, a pie graph on here too or some, somewhere I believe. But this is probably the most powerful. Anyways, play around with this in the different reports. Um, these are some things that really help price a home. Now, here's the other thing I want to I want to do while we have this up, and I want to try and blow this up for you guys. Come on, what is it? FN plus. Okay, so everybody, can you guys read these increments? I want to make sure the video can see these. Uh, zero to 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150. I want to talk about something for a second here. When a buyer goes to get pre-approved, do they or do they not get pre-approved in increments of $25,000 typically? So there's a psychological piece to a buyer. And in here, this, this, this kind of goes into um, a little bit about like when you're on a buyer's agent side and then also at, when you're on the selling side of things. When I have, when I know that the comp range is, let's call it five, let's say, let's call it my comp range is five, maybe high 400s to 525. And 525 is pushing it. And I have a seller who wants to go, well, let's try, let's push the envelope to 535, let's call it. What I know as an agent is most buyers get pre-approved in increments of $25,000. And so if somebody prices a home at five thirty-five, dollars I need a buyer. I, buyers that are going to be looking at this home are going to be buyers that are pre-approved for five fifty dollars and under. So you just eliminated, the, the seller just eliminated all of the buyers that are pre-approved for five twenty-five dollars and under. Well, if you go back to that graph, and maybe I'm using the wrong numbers here, but if you go back to that graph, 550 to 599, um, you, you're gonna have a decent amount of showings, but you're gonna have about half of some of these other areas, right? And so what you wanna do is you wanna watch this because buyers are pre-approved in increments of $25,000. Your seller could be making or breaking the difference between a multiple offer situation and maybe some activity in one offer. Does that make sense? You're, you're a buyer that wants to price a home above the comp range, above another buyer's increment is going to have a hard time selling that home, traditionally speaking, right? Especially when you get into these upper echelons. So if I have a buyer that wants to list their home at at 735, but I think that it should be listed around 700,000, only buyers 750 and under are going to see that. And there's a drastic change in the amount of showings. The change in the amount of showings is a change in the amount of buyers in the market. And so another thing to price the home correctly is, is watch those $25,000 increments. Watch what side of that line you fall on. I like to be on the higher side of that increment. So in my world, if, I, if you wanna price that thing at 535, why not price it at 549? It's the same buyer pool, right? So be careful when you have a buyer who wants to go cross those, those, those echelons or those increments of 25,000. 
I know that to a seller, $10,000 is a lot more money, but to a seller that needs to sell the home and is perfectly acceptable at receiving the seller proceeds at 525, do everything in your power to under, make them understand they're really losing a large buyer pool because the 525 and under aren't going to be, this, this house isn't going to hit their search. So on the flip side, be a good buyer's agent. Be the buyer's agent that when you get a pre-approval letter for 525, pick up the phone and call the listing agent and say, hey, or I'm sorry, not the listing agent, call the lender and say, hey, is the buyer, is that the max, max, max? Or did you just put in 525? Can they go up to 535? And some, and most times you'll hear the lender say, well, yeah, yeah, 525 is just, you know, just kind of where they wanted their budget to be. But yeah, if they went up to 537, 535, that only increased their purchase, their, their the monthly payment by like $17 a month. Um, they'd be happy to. Okay, what about 550? Well, 550, you know, we're really going to be stretching it there. It'd have to be the right home, no HOA, and the right taxes, and we might be able to get it done. Great. I appreciate your time. Go back to the selling or go back to the buyer side and say, hey, look, I just talked to the lender. I know your pre-approval says 525. However, I, I feel very confident that we could probably list or we could probably set your search for maybe, you know, 540 and under. So that way you don't miss some of those different properties that are in there. Would that be okay to you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer? Then you really are you really are showing them what their market is allowing them to have. When I say their market, that's a buyer's market. Their pre-approval amount becomes their market. And if we just have a lender who just throws out increments of $25,000 and we're not a good buyer's agent having those conversations, then we could be we could be in trouble. That I, you guys I I 51 buyers in one seller's market. These are the tactics I used. I would always get a buyer to go up just over top of that little threshold there. And sure enough, sellers that basically shot themselves in the foot by listing it just over that threshold would just get my offer, one offer. I get my inspection items fixed. I'd get everything done um, and maybe not even have to go over list price. I think my average in that market was I was at I hovered between 99% of list price and 101 when the when the market was selling at 102 to 104. And it's just because of these these simple tactics. So I'm so glad we came back around and Michelle and and Brady and everybody uh, Ricardo had a listing that he was talking about. Um, all of these different points that we went over today, you guys, are are things that I've heard multiple different times. So oops, let me. Thanks, Ricky. So we got some more time. We got some more stuff to talk about. Okay. Going back to that scenario, when we talked about price, we talked about square foot. The smaller homes always sell for a higher price per square foot because there's just more buyer demand. Um, and it's, all, it's more buyer demand because of where people averagely earn incomes. Pricing the home in accordance to those increments of $25,000 is also going to be something you want to look at. But going back to Brady's situation, he's got this, this monstrosity. I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many square foot it was, but it was a large home in an area that comps were coming out to be a lot less square foot. I don't even know how to explain it, but one of the things that a lot of agents would look to do is go, well, you know, I heard, I heard an appraisal class. I heard a CMA class. I heard Bruce's class say, you know, you can sometimes put weight two things. And so some people would take the average square foot in the neighborhood and they would multiply that average price per square foot by the subject property. And if you did that, Brady's home would be significantly overpriced. But how do we get this house to price where it needs to be priced? How do we do that? Any ideas? And, and maybe I'm not setting up this situation correctly. But Caleb, what we were talking about is, is with Brady's property, he has a lot larger square foot than the average in the neighborhood, right? But if, you, if we know that a smaller home sells on average for a higher dollar amount cost per square foot, then you can't just take Brady's square foot and times it by the average in the neighborhood. Because 
we already we already know that smaller homes typically sell for a higher price per square foot than a larger home. So that w math won't work. You'll be so far out of whack, it's unreal. And then the seller's gonna be going, why isn't my home selling? I thought other homes in the neighborhood were selling at a buck 40 a square foot. And I, that's what we priced our house at. Brady, why isn't this selling? And Brady's going, I don't know, that's my tactic. And I'm picking on Brady. He doesn't have that listing yet. He's close, we're gonna get it. Um, but that would be a conversation that Brady might be run up against on, in this situation is, yeah, I don't know, like price per square foot in the neighborhood says this, but we certainly are getting no showings at this. So how do you price something like that? Any ideas? Um, the materials used for that, the back portion of it, um, cost of materials? You could, but, but it's old. So cost of materials today are a lot higher. I like where I like where your head's at though. Making sure that yeah, if you have a larger home, you know I've seen some homes that that tout this four thousand square foot, and I go in there and there's a two thousand square foot like three seasons room that's really not finished. Because the back part's finished, right? Or yeah, it's all finished. It's all a house. Yep. But but regardless of the nuances of Brady's situation, let's just say you have a regular family home but it's the biggest model in the neighborhood by a very significant amount. So my question is, is what would you do and how would we tackle it? Let me, let me revise that question. What's an appraiser gonna do? Appraiser's gotta come and appraise that house. What are they gonna do? So in this, what's that? Just pull comparables. To see well what type of comparables you're that you're close okay so we're not going to pull well we're going to pull so what what the appraiser is going to do is they're going to pull uh comparables in the neighborhood and then quickly they're going to probably come up with a, a goose egg because they can't find that similar square foot in that neighborhood because we already know that this this house is different so they're going to try and pull, pull comparables in the neighborhood but when they can't find their identical property in the neighborhood, what are they allowed to do at that point? Say it again, Michelle. Go outside the neighborhood, expand the search. Exactly. So here's what I've learned, and 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 it and I love for somebody to take an appraisal class and tell me that your your instructor didn't tell you this because you we want to learn a lot of different ways. I said this on the CMA class. You can never take enough CMA classes, take them with appraisers, take them with um, uh, loan officers, take them with real estate agents, take them with anybody. But what I've heard from an appraiser is, is like, it, like the rule of thumb is that they need to stay within a mile radius around the subject property. But if they can't find three comparable properties in that subject radius, they're allowed to expand. So what they what I'm envisioning an appraiser would do would be to expand it out and try and find houses of similar square foot. And here's the key. You have they have to find similar square foot homes in the similar build era. So they're gonna be needing to dial in a search that's a lot larger in diameter for the same square foot but we need to find a similar build era. So the 60s, the 70s, or 60s, the 80s, if they need. The 90s to 2000s, newer, 2000 or 2010 and into new. Maybe it's 60s and under. Maybe it's the 1900s, early 1900s. Then they're going to see what the, what, what the market is, is holding for that square foot with that build. Then they're going to take that and get a cost per square foot. Then they're going to go back into that neighborhood and say, okay, what are the, what are the updates in comparison to this home compared to the neighborhood? Because if you do have the cream of all crops, you have the updates, you have every bell and whistle, but everything in the neighborhood is kind of run down and nothing has sold that's been updated. You're not going to get much weight for your updates on that in that situation. 
But if everything's being updated and now you got a price per square foot and now you can put, now you can kind of see some similar nuances. Now you're probably going to be more in alignment with where the market's going to hold. Same thing on the reverse. You have the 800 square foot home in a neighborhood that trends at 2,500 square foot. You're going to be doing the same things. Now, here's the one other thing that they're going to be careful of. As an appraiser expands this, what happens? You are in different territories. So you could have over here, you could find three homes that are, are, are you know, you could find three homes at 4,000 square foot and get an average price per square foot. But then on this side of the home, on this side of the neighborhood, or uh, I'm sorry, on this side of the city, you could find another three homes with 4,000 square feet. And it could be a completely different, completely different price per square foot. Now, what does an appraiser do? A lot of times when I teach something like this and I tell people this, they'll say, well, if the subject property is in the middle of those two, wouldn't they just combine all of those homes and come up with an average price per square foot? They may, but they got to do one other thing first. Why is this 4,000 square foot subject cluster pricing so much differently than this 4,000 square foot cluster? So in Colorado, we have the mountains that draws price. I'm just going to be honest with you, right? So they're going to look at and see why they want to know why that's such a difference. But if they get, you know, if they do a, a, a three mile radius around the subject property and they find one house here and one house here and one house here, they'll probably do the average. But if they find clusters with a big discrepancy, they're not just going to put the average in there and tell your subject property at the average. They're going to see if your subject property, which one, if you pick that house up and put it in that cluster, would it fit? If the answer is no, then they're going to put it in this cluster and fit. And it'll fit in something, right? And then that's what they're going to put more weight on. So anyways, that's what Brady and I ended up having to do. Um, I hope Brady watches this. Shout out to Brady. Um, that was a tough one for me to run comps on with him. Um, and I, I did it at a time where I wasn't able to like have this 20 minute conversation about why I told Brady where the sellers wanted to price it is actually not a, not a bad price. They actually have this thing listed for sale by owner and a spot on price. So since I think it's spot on, what are the two things that cause homes not to sell? They're marketing. They're just not getting an exposure and it's a unique property. And so they're not getting the exposure and buyers probably look at that online and have a hard time wrapping their head around it. They need an agent to say, let's go look at this property. Okay. What are some other nuances, right? Some other nuances that we have a hard time comping out would be golf course communities. Uh, Melissa brought up patio homes in our other call. Um, what about, what about like some of these neighborhoods, like just drive around. Some of these neighborhoods will have like these duplexes, like, like five in a row, smack dab in the middle of like a residential neighborhood. And you go and do comps on, a, on a, an attached dwelling and there's nothing. What do you do? How do you work that out? So we're gonna, we're gonna finish this class with, how much time do I got? We're gonna finish this class with just some, I, some techniques. And I wanna end with saying, keep leaning into me guys. The, the questions that you guys are having around where to comp prices at, I don't care if you have a house that is a cookie cutter, you're pretty, you pretty darn know exactly where this thing should sell in price at, still run it by Harry and I. Harry and I will never do too many CMAs. You guys, that helps Harry and I's business too. The more CMAs we do, the better we get. The more CMAs you do, the better you get, Right. Yeah, we I don't do, care. I do them as practice. I'll just go yeah. grab a house and practice just because I want to be able to do them quicker, faster, and accurately for, for my client. Yep. I just did so, one the other day. Nice. I love that, Harry. Harry and I are, are ever learning. We ever want to keep growing with you guys too. So lean into us. But let's wrap this up with some of the nuances that we come up with. But there's a similar kind of principle around a lot of these nuances. 
okay? So just like we talked about with the price per square foot of, of you know, um, uh, of Brady subject property and how it's such a bigger property in comparison to the neighborhood. Well, sometimes when you're in a golf course community, it's really hard to find comps. Sometimes when you're in a golf course community, you got, you got, you got some that are, uh, that are off the, you know, the tee box. You got some that are in the middle of fairway and you got some that are right there where the green is and get hit and gets hit by, you know, the, uh, the, the hundred yard chip shots, you know, 17 times a year because it's just right there right? Golf courses are one of the most extreme ones. I mean, one of the hardest ones to comps. I've never seen something harder for me to comp uh, because they're designed that way. Like a golf course community is designed to be like this nice, like a, like this nice, I don't know what the word is, but like, it's a good feel. I like golf course communities. They, they got nice homes. They got, you know, these different layouts. They've got these, you know, some are some have this you know they 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 don't back they back to the golf course but like they never get to see any golfers because golfers just drive by on their way to the next hole then other people their backyard they sit out back and and have their beverage on an afternoon and they they're like 50 feet away from golfers teeing off all day long what's that worth what is that how do you how does somebody want that um i myself i love action I'm probably the type of person that's living on a golf course. I would rather have one where I could probably, you know, jump the fence at the end of the night and go chip some balls in. Right. So I'm going to be the guy that wants to watch golfers golf. Like I want that action. That's TV to me. One of you guys here in this room might be the person that would love to live in a golf course community, but needs to be like on the opposite side of the pond that's on the opposite side of the tee box. So that way you're, you're like a thousand foot away from golfers. You can't hear them. They can't hear you. You can't see them, but you don't back to any other homes. So in a golf course community, is it, there's a lot of preference, right? And you'll never know that preference. So quit. So don't, don't worry about the preference. What I'm, what I'm getting at is with a golf course community and you're having a hard time comp it, Go to other golf courses and see where they're at. See if the, that's the first thing that I would do is see if another golf course community has similar style homes. If they don't, forget about it. Don't try and comp off those properties. Uh, but if you're having a hard time, see if another golf course in the area has similar style homes. If they do, you can start to get close. The other thing with a golf course community or harder to comp communities, Michelle, what did we do with yours? Or maybe you don't know what I did with yours. Uh, are you asking me or? Yeah, sorry, Kramer. Yep, sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we've done a couple of things because I ran a few different CMAs on it. Are you talking about yesterday what we did? No, mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm talking about is in communities and not just golf course communities, but patio home communities, um, duplexes that are you know, uh, just there's five in a neighborhood. Either go to another area of the same town and see if you can't get similar. Because here's the thing. Uh, buyers may or may not just be looking just in that golf course community, right? They might be, you might have, th th that's, that's rare, right? When you have a buyer who's like, I need to be in a golf course community and only this golf course community. You're going to have some of those people, but that's rare. So if I have a buyer that comes to, to Loveland or Longmont or Fort Collins and says, Bruce, I want to buy a home. I don't want to back to anything. And I really like golf courses. I'm going to set up a search for golf courses. So that means that an appraiser can do the same thing. Just like the square footage thing, they're going to expand their area. If they can't find similar properties, then they're going to work until they do because they know that a buyer's market is what depicts what a value is. And if a buyer's looking in one golf course community, they're probably looking in multiple. So whatever properties you have, try and go there, try and go there. If that doesn't work, the next thing that I did with Michelle's is I just go back a lot farther in history. So, what I mean by that is, is, is if a, if a, if an appraiser, so my rule of thumb is I like to find things 
zero to three months back that have sold. If I can't find what I'm looking for, then I go back six months. That's when an appraiser is allowed to use. But again, if an appraiser can't find what they're looking for and have to fit inside their box, they're going to be given the grace by their appraisal management company to get outside of that box. So then they might go back a full year. They might go to a different town. They might go, they might go to a different golf course. They might go to a different subdivision to find those subdivisions that also have those like one-off duplex homes. They might look for the whole city for the other duplex homes. So they, they are allowed to break out of their little box when the subject property can't fit in that box. They don't just throw up their hands and go, well, since it doesn't fit in the box, like we can't appraise it. And, you know, buyer, you don't get the loan. Have a nice day. Try and find another house. They don't do that. Uh, well, huh. we're recording this. They do do that sometimes, just so you know. There's very few times they do it, but I'm talking about a house doesn't fit in a box, meaning like you can't find an appraiser right now to comp a container home. Does anybody know what a container home is? Container home is mm -hmm. one of those, what's that? Mini home. Yeah, one of those yeah it's, like a, it's like, a, like a mini home. But a, a container home is like one of those railroad, those railroad cars, those containers, those storage containers. They're metal, big. They're retrofitting those into little tiny homes now. Well, appraisers one is not going to appraise it, and a lender is not going to lend on it because it's probably not fixed to the to property, and so it's too risky for the lender to where the you know the person could just pick up the house and leave. So that's what I'm saying. Like the there's there's some houses that don't fit in the box, that don't fit in the box. Like they're just not going to be lended on, but if your subject property is a stick built home, it's just, a, it's just unique. They're going to go outside of their area. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to look maybe back in time. We might need to look at a different uh, golf course. We might need to look at a totally different neighborhood that has a very similar feel and characteristics to it. Um, what, what are some other things that we, that, that an appraiser is going to be, um, conscious of major, major highways, major, major geographic nuances. And when I say major ne geographic nuances is um, if you guys ever drive up by Carter Lake, Horse Tooth, um, they're not mountain, pro I wouldn't consider them mountain properties. But I certainly wouldn't put them. I, I certainly wouldn't put them up to properties that are over on the, you know, uh, acreage properties on the east side of those towns. They're acreage properties in their own little unique area. So a, a, an appraiser that's having a hard time pre, uh, comping something over at Horsetooth might have to come all the way down to Carter Lake to try and get an idea, and then because if they, you know, if Horsetooth just you know, trends at a different rate, maybe they have to put weight on it, either good, bad, or indifferent. But those properties, those acres properties, they're not mountain properties, but they're not rural. They're not farmland. They're a different caliber. They don't fit inside that box all the time if you can't find comps, so they got to go outside. So um, major intersections, um, railroad tracks, um, uh, uh, main streets, I-25, look what I-25 does. How many times how many times in my history have I heard, hey, Bruce, I, you, you search, man. You're sending me stuff that's you know east of I-25. I want to be west of I-25. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've seen a lot of houses east of I-25 that have incredible views for $100,000 less than something on the other side of I-25 that doesn't have any views. It's quite amazing to me, but it's people's perspectives and opinions, right? So those are some bigger nuances that you want to stay away from. Those are the things that an appraiser is going to look at. So if I'm looking out east, let's call it east of I-25, and I need a, a 10 acre piece of property to be, um, I need a 10 acre piece of property to be appraised with a house on it and everything like that. And they can't find any comps. But if they go across I-25 on the west side and they can find all sorts of comps, they're probably still not going to use it or they might put historical weight on it. Most likely, they're going to go out further east or north and south and try and stay on that other side of I-25. 
And so again, when you guys come up with these, these major nuances, just reach out, give me a call. Uh, Michelle's wasn't easy. Brady's wasn't easy. No matter how much I can teach you guys in these classes, it's not going to be easy, but I think now you guys will have more of a food for thought than just the how to do a CMA, if that makes sense. Questions before I end the recording. Real quick, Bruce, there's another thing you can do is any, any one of our agents who get appraisals and have them handy, share them with some of the other folks because it teaches you part of how an appraisal is done and what different appraisers are, are um, using for their square foot kind of things or what they value a home at uh, condition wise, what they're given for bathrooms, what they're given for the basement square feet, things like that. So when you can get those, share them with one another. Uh, they're very helpful. Yes, they are. And that, that's a really good point here, Ian. That, that's what, uh, were you addressing Melissa's question? Uh, no, I could have, sorry. Oh, no, no. Um, that's one of the best ways though, uh, because remember, uh, Melissa, uh, an appraisal is an opinion, unfortunately. Yep, there's, there's not, when you say a standard form, what it is is find what, an average opinion would be. Yep. You so, what? yep. Yep. So, I, I've never found an average form. Appraisers aren't going to publish that because they're opinion based and it's just wrong. Um, um, but when you have, I know what you're saying, right? What are the values? So, what Melissa's, I think, is asking is, is like some of the other things that come up that we didn't hit home on here was. You know, what if you have a, a subject property with no garage in an area that trends at a two car or three car garage? It just so happened, maybe this, this home, that subject home, they had a two car garage at one time and it burnt down. And so now they never rebuilt it. They didn't care. They didn't have it, but they're smack dab in the middle of a two car or three car garage neighborhood. What kind of weight is that? I think that's what Melissa's asking is, yeah, is, you is can, there a standard and, value? And Melissa, one of, the, one of the things you can do is go look at uh, some that were sold and look at what an appraiser or what it was sold at and what they gave for, um, uh, well, again, it gets back to appraisals and I apologize, but if you get enough appraisals and you'll find that in certain areas, they give 10,000 for the garage, right? So you know, at the end of the day, if what Bruce was just mentioning, one has a garage and one doesn't, you know that that value is going to change about 10 grand. But again, it's going to depend on the area. It's going to depend on how many appraisals you looked at. But the more appraisals that you can get a hold of, the more information you're going to find out. What do they get for basements? You know, is it $11? Some get 15. I just looked at one the other day. A guy gave 40. And I'm like, 40 bucks? I've never heard of that ever, ever. And I go, this is a mistake. I think he didn't mean to put 40. Yeah. The point is, the more appraisals you can get a hold of and look at, and you know, uh, is is just a great thing to do. If you guys ever want, to give... say it. Well, I, I, sometimes I'll go to Jesse. Come on, let me look at a couple of your appraisals, and then I'll go into the office and look at a couple because it just helps me, right? If just... anybody ever wants appraisals, I've got lots in my email. You can look at. Them. Um, I just had a, I just had a buyer go under contract, uh, maybe three weeks ago or so. And, um, that buyer, um, uh, put it, went in, I think $8,000 over list price and put in $8,000 appraisal, de uh, deficit, uh, guarantee. And it came in $8,500 less than comp price. So now I've got $500 to deal with, but when I get that, uh, uh, uh appraisal, I can send it out to you guys too. Um, I don't have the full, full report just yet. Um, um, but, but yeah, to address Melissa's question, there, there's not, I don't know of a standard sheet, but what I can tell you is, is, is in Colorado and this, this only comes from experience. This only comes from going to appraisal classes, sitting in the front of the room, like the brown noser that I'm not and drilling an appraiser with multiple questions around my frustrations that I've felt in my career in real estate. And um, I can tell you that in Ohio, where I buy my rental properties, a, a, a garage bay is worth about $5,000. So a two car garage in Ohio gets an appraisal value of around $10,000. A 
two car garage in Colorado gets it about $20,000 appraisal value. I don't really know exactly why. I think it's just a trend. I think, again, it's an opinion. It's just tr history. It's tradition. It's experience. Um, and that's what appraisers used to. Um, I'm going to end the recording there. And I, if you guys want to hang on the phone here, I got another topic. Take care, guys. Have a great day.